the first speaker of the evening. My good friend from college. We got him active in politics about a year ago, bringing him to the Chris Ann Hall event. Now, Ben and I have enjoyed many brewskis and whiskeys talking about the Constitution. Yeah, we are geeks. <laughs> but we care about this country. And ever since we got him to go to that Chris Ann Hall event, he said, you know what, let's take it to the next level. Let's start the East Metro Tea Party. And by the way, let's, let's start more tea parties. And let me speak to these people about the Constitution. And he took that first step. And then he started writing a book. And then he got asked to blog for the Tenth Amendment Center, which is pretty big. And he's got a website, he's got a podcast. Dave Benner is one of the foremost experts, I'm going to say, on the Constitution here in Minnesota. And we get him every month at the East Metro Tea Party tonight. He's going to speak about a topic that matters a lot to you, separations of powers. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Benner. Thank you. It's great to be here. And how about this turnout for a frigid Arctic temperature? Thank you. Give yourselves a hand for that. So if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, Neither internal nor external controls on government would be necessary. That was the words of James Madison writing his Publius in Federalist 51, and his words ring true today, to be sure. James Madison was making the point that, you know, if, if men were impervious and uh, perfect, you know, we wouldn't need to have government. But since we do, we need to have controls on those officials. And those controls are largely embodied in the separation of powers doctrine that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, Madison all, all also wrote that the magistrate in whom the whole executive power resides cannot himself make a law. And that's an important maxim that we should know because I don't know where you guys were, but last week uh, we had a president in his speech from the throne, I mean State of the Union address, I'm sorry, said when suggesting that if Congress didn't pass the laws that he wanted to pass, he would essentially make them himself, saying, I've got a pen, and I can use that pen to sign executive orders. Well, that's certainly in stark contrast to Madison's opinions. It's, it's necessary that we understand the separation of powers doctrine, why it's important, why it was respected, and why the founders chose to implement that doctrine into our Constitution. Now, Madison also said that basically the whole power of one department is exercised by the same hands which possess the whole power of another department. The fundamental principles of a free constitution are subverted. So he's basically saying if one branch of the federal government exercises the powers that were delegated to another branch, it subverts the constitution. Essentially, it's unconstitutional. Well, it's too bad that I have to tell our president that he's proposing doing the exact same thing as Madison warns against here. So, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how this doctrine was formed. Um, Charles Louis de Secondal, otherwise known as Montesquieu, wrote, There can be no liberty where the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person. He wrote this in his famous book, L'Esprit des Lois, or as a French linguist will recognize, The Spirit of the Laws. Spirit of the Laws. Is there anyone that speaks or understands French here, by the way? Good. How did I do with that? Did I botch that or no? All right, I botched it. If I tried, I made it sound like I knew what I was talking about. So. But uh, Montesquieu argued that liberty was most likely to succeed and be pre prevalent in a situation in which powers were diffused between multiple power centers not only when it comes to the federal government, but also in the federalist relationship between the states and the federal government. So we see that in the form of uh, Amendment 10 of the Constitution, that the powers that the general government doesn't have, the states have. And in like fashion, our Constitution is strictly segmented into Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, different powers for the different legislative branches. Now, the executive does have some authorities, and the, the way the Constitution phrases this in Article 2, Section 2 is that the executive power is vested in a president of the United States of America. It goes on to list the executive powers that the president has and touches on one of the, these four topics, basically. So the president has to be the commander-in-chief in the times that um, war is declared. Uh, he's the head of the state, so he the, has the ability to represent the United States to foreign nations. 
He's the chief law enforcement officer, and underneath him are the attorney general. Um, he's also the head of the executive branch, so he has the incidental power to instruct his subordinates. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit also about how executive orders have kind of morphed over time until the current situation. Now, I've heard the sentiment sometime that says, you know, the president shouldn't exercise any uh, executive orders, and that's, that's not true. The president, as the chief executive officer, has to be able to instruct his subordinates on what to do. However, that does not mean, and uh, it, it basically makes, uh, the president starts to have trouble when he starts to imply and infer and kind of push forward a mentality that says he can enact law himself, which is, would be binding on all of us, which essentially the president proposed point blank last week, by the way. Um, and that's, that's basically where this situation has devolved into a situation that has generally started from you know, incidental powers that the executive had all the way to the current time, where they try to make it as law. Um, Theodore Roosevelt was really the first one to take executive power to a whole new level, as you can kind of see here. Um, presidents such as Roosevelt acted to replace potential legislation with kingly edicts, um, making the notion of executive powers um, something that had never been realized before. Um, perhaps the most tyrannical use of an executive power, in my estimation, is Franklin Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066, which confined all Americans of Japanese ancestry into militarized zones and interred them indefinitely during times of war. Now, it, it, it got to that point. It got to the point where executive orders used to be the executive instructing his subordinates on what to do, to literally seizing liberty from thousands of people for no reason other than their suspectability. So that, that pernicious and abominable decision, by the way, was backed up by a Supreme Court decision called Korematsu versus the United States in 1944, one of the most abominable and callous Supreme Court decisions of all time. Now, the, the purpose of executive orders, as I said, were kind of in incidental tasks. Like, this is one subject that I've written a little bit about in my book, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about a few of them. For instance, when George Washington became president, one of the first things he did was contacted the Confederation government that had existed before the first Congress and asked some of the key officials to impress me with a full, precise, and distinct general idea of the affairs of the United States. Pretty harmless, right? Another thing he did was make a proclamation that a specific day in 1789 would be one of prayer and thanksgiving. Uh, John Quincy Adams made a general order in 1826 to honor Thomas Jefferson, who died that year. And Martin Van Buren in 1837 wrote an order to provide then-former President Andrew Jackson with medical care from the Surgeon General. So, again, all this stuff's harmless. None of these things were binding as laws on all individuals. But that's, that's where we've gotten. And you can kind of see the progression. Um, Roosevelt, the Roosevelts took it to a brand new level, but we can see, you know, these... Uh, these executive orders have been elevated. Um, some presidents in the 19th and 18th centuries barely used executive powers at all. In fact, some presidents didn't have executive orders at all, like Rutherford Hayes, um, James Garfield. Gar Garfield was only president for about six months, but still, come on. So, um, Madison wisely stated in Virginia's ratifying convention that all men having power ought to be mistrusted. So we should realize that there is really a distinct divide between executive orders that are constitutional and executive orders that are not constitutional. And that's where I'll end, but I'll just say that Jake wanted me to talk a little bit about a few nullification efforts that are taking place around the United States right now. Um, recently blogging with the 10th Amendment Center, it's kind of exposed me to some of these things. Uh, one of the most powerful to me is Tennessee's legislature right now is entertaining a bill that would literally cut off water and power to the NSA spy facility in Oak Ridge. I think all friends of the Fourth Amendment should respect that. Right? In Missouri and Florida, bills are being raised to completely nullify any future legislation that would impede Second Amendment rights or gun ownership rights. Um, in certain states right now in Montana, the Democratic governor of Montana just wrote a letter to the Department of Homeland Security saying that he opposed any form of implementation of the real ID standards or a national identification card. So th this stuff is powerful. It's sweeping like brush fires throughout all the states.
And we should be supporting candidates here, in my estimation, that would pronounce the same sort of ideas. So thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank, thank you all. All righty. Go to DaveBender.com and uh, somewhere on there you got to have a link to your podcast, right, Dave? Yes, sir. Okay, so go check out DaveBender.com. He does a fantastic podcast. And Jack says, you got to explain what a podcast is to people. It's really sweet. It's like radio, but you record it on a computer and you can listen to it anytime you want. And Dave usually does about 20 to 30 minutes a time on some kind of constitutional segment. So it's really cool. I would definitely recommend listening to it. And then uh, read his blogs on 10th Amendment Center, too. Okay.